To begin our, the rest of our afternoon's program, uh, we will hear from Jeremy Warren, who is a leading specialist in sculpture and the decorative arts, especially of the Renaissance period. His three-volume catalog of the medieval and Renaissance sculpture in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford uh, received the Apollo Magazine Art Book of the Year Award in 2014. Formerly collections and academic director of the Wallace Collection, a position Jeremy held the last time he took to this stage at one of our symposia, uh, his catalog of the Italian sculpture for that museum was published in 2016. It includes a number of important new discoveries, including the identification of a small portrait sculpture as the work of Andrea Riccio, and the discovery of a Richelieu collection provenance for a Roman bust of a satyr. Exhibitions that Jeremy has curated include Renaissance Master Bronzes from the Ashmolean Museum and Beauty and Power, Renaissance and Baroque Bronzes from Peter Marino Collection. That was in 2010. Among his many other sculpture publications are articles on the Italian Renaissance sculptors Antico, Vincenzo and Gian Girolamo Grandi, Leone Leoni, and Severo da Ravenna. He has also written an essay on ivory reliefs by the Flemish sculptor Francis von Bossuet a survey of the collecting of sculpture by Jambologna in Britain, and, the art and articles on forgeries of Renaissance sculpture and decorative arts during the 19th century in Florence, and on the collecting of sculpture in Renaissance Bologna. Jeremy has a strong interest in the history of collections, in particular the growth of early collections and the collecting of sculpture and decorative arts in the 19th century. Publications on this area include essays and articles on early collections and plaquettes uh, in Britain and German museum director Wilhelm von Bode and Anglo-Florentine cultural relations in the 1850s and 60s. Jeremy is honorary secretary of the Society of Antiquaries of London and a corresponding member of the Academia dell'Arte de Disegno in Florence. And this afternoon, we will enjoy hearing him address the subject of collecting small bronze sculptures in Renaissance. Italy. Please give a warm welcome back to Jeremy Warren. Thank you very much, Inga, and I would like to thank Inga Malcolm and the Frick Collection for the invitation to speak at this, this marvellous conference, which, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing all the other papers, and I hope you'll enjoy mine. The small bronze has come to be regarded as one of the emblematic expressions of the Italian Renaissance, much sought after by collectors from the late 19th century onwards. Italian bronzes can today be found in museums across the world, and by no means least the stellar collection here at the Frick, which I show you uh, three wonderful examples. Small bronzes are easily portable, and they were often classical or mythological in subject, so they were an excellent means by which Renaissance man could satisfy his love affair with the world of antiquity. And it's no surprise that the earliest secure, independent small bronze sculpture from the Italian Renaissance, Philoratus Marcus Aurelius in Dresden, should be a reduction of a famous surviving monument from antiquity. Latin texts helped to remind well-educated Renaissance men and women of the attraction that small bronzes had held for their Roman predecessors. And thus, the Roman author Pliny wrote that owners of the bronze figurines called Corinthian are usually so enamored of them that they carry them about with them, citing the Emperor Nero, who had always with him his bronze figure of an Amazon, which might have looked a little like the one you see on the left. And on the right, you have a beautiful figure of Aphrodite from Petrus near Corinth, and Corinthian bronze in the antique world was regarded as the, the gold standard of, of metal casting. The 15th century cardinal Francesco Gonzaga, who ensured that his bronze figures and other special treasures always traveled with him, would certainly have known this reference. The Venetian collector Marc Antonio Michiel in the early 16th century who had a small but important collection of bronzes, and I'm showing you here on the left um, the Hecate in Berlin, which was certainly in Michiel's collection and described in an inventory as a figure with three faces. And on the right, um, a wonderful little bronze in Birmingham, which is the only existing bronze which corresponds to a description of a little boy riding a billy goat. 
so it may well have been in his collection as well. And he made explicit the connection between the written text and the visual when he wrote in 1514 that it is natural that what we read expressed so clearly with our ears, not content, we also wish to gaze on with our eyes. Marc Antonio, who was a friend of contemporary artists such as Riccio, was well aware of what was classical antiquity and what was modern in his collection and in those of other collectors in Venice and the Veneto. But this distinction may not always have been clear, as we shall see. Most collectors at the time would have aspired to own works from ancient Greece and Rome, but they were rare and very expensive. Many would-be collectors had instead to make do with modern equivalents. As Fra Saba da Castiglione noted in the 1550s, he wrote, some others adorn their houses with antiquities, heads, torsos, busts, and antique statues made of marble or of bronze. But because good ancient works are so rare and unobtainable without the greatest difficulty and expense, they therefore adorn them with the works of Donatello, who in both carving and casting can be compared with any ancient Greek sculptor. Modern bronzes were expensive enough, though, so it's unusual to find more than a couple in inventories. And it's worth making the point here that um, I'm not aware of a single um, collector in Renaissance Europe who only collected bronzes. Um, as, as Malcolm suggested in his paper, they were always collected as part of a larger collection to go with pictures, um, antique, antique marbles, and, and so forth. Saba, uh, it seems, didn't own a single bronze. At the time of his death in 1510, the wealthy Bolognese humanist Bartolomeo Bianchini, whom you see on the left in his portrait by Francia, had just three bronzes in his study, described as a horse's head, a man's head, and a little figure. Now these are typical of the bald descriptions that we usually find in inventories. Another example um, it comes in the 1555 inventory of the Venetian collector Andrea Odoni, whom you see in the famous portrait by Lorenzo Lotto on the, the right. Um, an inkstand of bronze, that's all we have. So only rarely will an inventory description of a collection tell us more than the bare facts and statistics of ownership, making it all but impossible to get a very clear picture of what was actually in the collection. And although we'd love to know precisely what bronzes Bianchini and Odoni owned, this is unlikely ever to be possible. Today, however, I would like to present to you an exception, an inventory that really does take us to the heart of a late Renaissance collection. Its owner, Roberto Canonici, was an antiquarian from the city of Ferrara. Not a grand aristocrat, but socially broadly on the same scale as wealthy merchants such as Bianchini and Odoni. We have no identified portrait of Roberto Canonici, so while I talk about the background to his collection, I'm going to put up for you the title page and one image from a little instruction book on etching by the Ferrari's painter Giuseppe Caletti, one of several books dedicated to Canonici, and you can see the dedication to him on the title page on the left. Roberto was born in 1568. He chose not to follow his father into military service, but instead followed a life dedicated to study and to the collecting of works of art. At one point, he was in the service of Duke Alfonso d'Este II, whilst he also acted as a collecting agent for Cardinal Borromeo in Milan. In 1612, Roberto's son Francesco was killed in a sword accident, a tragedy which may have spurred him on to try to preserve his collection um, for posterity as his substitute child, if you like. It seems to have been fully formed by 1620, when Agostino Superbi, in another book dedicated to Canonici, described him as a most honorable gentleman who exhibits all the fine qualities appropriate to a noble person, about whom though I will say no more, so as not to offend the natural modesty of a man who is known throughout our city as a stranger to any sort of ambition and vanity. Superbi wrote of how Canonici took a particular delight in every sort of antiquity, as can be seen from his most beautiful and noble studio, in which from marbles onwards nothing is left to be desired, since the paintings, I believe, are not only superior to any comparable collection, and in addition, there may be seen bronzes, antique carved gems in various stones, and other products of nature and of art, quite impossible to describe. 
A year later, in 1621, Marc Antonio Guarini wrote of how Roberto has, with his large fortune, brought together from various places a large number of the rarest pictures with figures and medals in bronze, gold and silver coins, ancient intaglio gems in various stones, cameos mounted in gold, and many other most excellent things of his sort, as well as a vast quantity of drawings and prints, old and modern and of the finest quality. Canonici was evidently happy to share his studio with its fine collections, Superbi telling us that it was freely open to anyone with an interest in antiquarian things and any great man who visits our city. It was in 1627 that Canonici drew up his first will in which he showed particular concern for the future of his collection, appointing as the guardians of the will the priests of the Church of San Giovanni Battista. His legacy was his nephew, Giacinto Canonici, upon whom Roberto imposed a series of conditions designed to prevent the disposal of any objects from the collection, or indeed even their temporary removal from the family palace on Via San Benedetto. To enforce these obligations, Roberto drew up a detailed inventory of the collection, which was printed in 1632, the year after his death. And this is what I think is the only surviving copy of the printed will in the Biblioteca Ariostea in Ferrara. I must briefly relate the sad outcome of the story in which Roberto's very punctiliousness was his undoing. He went to the trouble of exempting his heirs from their obligations only in the event of acts of force majeure, war, fire, or floods. So conveniently, perhaps a few years later in 1638, fire destroyed the studio and the palace. Although the nephew, Giacinto, apparently had enough time to rescue the most valuable portions of the collections, notably the paintings. And it's telling that within a week, he had begun negotiations with the Duke of Modena for the sale of some of the pictures. By the time of another inventory in 1655, much had already gone. We don't know whether the bronzes were rescued or mostly left to perish in the fire. Now, the Canonici collection is actually rather well known, at least for its paintings. Giuseppe Campori published as long ago as 1870 the printed inventory, which has ever since been regularly mined by scholars of painting. The exactitude of Canonici's <coughs> descriptions allow many pictures to be identified. To give you just two examples, the Metropolitan Museum's well-known painting of a dead Christ in a landscape by, Car by Carpaccio is clearly recognizable, albeit attributed to Mantegna. The dead Christ of Andrea Mantegna, on a seat next to a ruined building, set in a landscape where there are some animals and birds, whilst two old men, seated and more naked than clothed, look upon him in a black and gold frame, value 150 scudi. Hardly less easily identifiable is Antonello da Messina's portrait of a man in the National Gallery, London. A head wearing a red cap, half shaved, which is the true portrait of Antonello da Messina by his own hand, has a thin gold frame which may be changed for something better, 100 scudi. Unlike the paintings, the nearly 40 bronzes in the Canonici collection appear hardly to have been considered by scholars in the past. Indeed, just one bronze has been identified with an actual surviving object, the Etruscan bronze statuette known as the Apollo of Ferrara, which passed from the Este collections into the French royal collections and is today in Paris. Stefano Bruni and Cristina Caggianelli recognized this as the bronze described in the Canonici inventory as a figure of a young man standing in bronze, his right hand rests on his hip, and around the arm there is a drapery. The left arm is missing. He wears buskins, that's little boots, and on the left leg there are certain letters, um, and I hope you can see those certain letters going down the leg there. The pedantic manner in which Canonici records this bronze is an extremely accurate visual description of a sculpture. Although there are a few exceptions, such as a lamp in bronze or three heads in bronze, and sadly, 300 medals with no more description, which is what you almost inevitably get in these inventories, most of the other bronzes are described in a similarly detailed manner. And this has allowed me to identify a good proportion of them with models that survive today. And thus, we can reconstruct to a fair degree this part of Roberto Canonici's collection. The sense of rediscovery is akin to what Mark MacDonald 
now of the Met, but then of the British Museum, must have felt when he came across the detailed inventory of Ferdinand Columbus, son of Cristoforo, allowing him to reconstruct much of Ferdinand's large collection of prints. And I show you two examples here, and you can read the descriptions, and you can see how they do allow you to map out the objects ab absolutely accurately. So I will now take you on a virtual tour of Roberta Canonici's bronzes, broadly following the sequence in the inventory, as if we were going around the collection in the studio in Ferrara in the late 1620s. Just to stress that my illustrations of the model so do not imply that these were the actual examples in Roberta Canonici's collection, although in some cases that is not impossible. The first descriptions immediately demonstrate Canonici's apparent complete lack of interest in the subject matter of his bronzes, which has to be deduced from the description. The first, he describes, must have represented Hercules holding the serpent in his left hand, his, the right hand presumably his club. So very similar, if in reverse, to the large figure in Dresden attributed to Francesco Giorgio di Martini. The next figure is clearly also Hercules, who holds in his right hand a club, the end of which is placed on the ground. Next to his right foot, in his left hand, he appears to hold three balls. Well, this is clearly his club and the apples of a Hesperides. And this description matches closely the fine Florentine bronze figure in the Victorian Albert Museum. The following series of bronzes of the goddess Venus, described simply as a woman. One must have been an early small bronze derivation from the antique marble figure of the Venus Callipagus, or Venus of the Beautiful Buttocks, only discovered in the mid-16th century. Um, and you see the description there. Um, and notice how he talked about the drapery hanging down covering her leg, which I think is the clincher there. Two more appear to be versions of a well-known model of the Venus Pudica, also after the antique, which survives in both clothed and part clothed versions. And on the left, you have um, a, a naked version. Uh, this is the version which was recorded since the 16th century in the Amabach collection in Basel. Uh, the second, uh, which was draped, her upper half naked, remained a clothed, must have been a version of the Fortnum Venus in Oxford. Although it's difficult to understand what is meant here by closed face. Uh, as Venus has to use her left hand to hold up her drapery. Perhaps it was a euphemism for the pudenda, or they had to say canonically she didn't go in for euphemisms, really. Yet another female figure is likely to have been a depiction of a classical heroine Lucretia, known from a number of comparable but not identical models. So you see a, um, a bronze of a woman, she holds a dagger in her right hand, the other hangs down. We're on shore ground with a group of beautiful but mysterious female bronzes. And the first is a little studied allegorical figure which survives in versions in Berlin, Venice, and Vienna. And Roberta Canonici rightly drew attention to the subtle beauty of a clinging drapery. is clothed in a beautiful cloak which covers her from her right shoulder downwards. And it's absolutely, definitely must be this bronze. Inhabiting much the same world is the drapery in an allegorical figure of charity, known from versions in Vienna and in Washington, um, where she's, just, she's described as dressed in a mantle and holding a burning flame in her right hand. The wonderful composition of a sleeping nymph, versions of which are in Berlin, Cambridge, and elsewhere, has been variously attributed to Mantua, but Volker Kran has proposed it as Paduan and the work of a close associate of Riccio, which seems quite possible. The Berlin example, which I show you here, is the only known version to retain the tree trunk, which is described by Canonici, a tree trunk with a fork in it upon which she places her right arm. So it is conceivable that this could be the very example once in the Canonici collection. This sleeping girl takes us towards the pagan world of nymphs and satyrs. There were two kneeling satyrs in the Canonici collection, of the type invented in Padua and Ravenna by Severa da Ravenna, you see an example from Cleveland on the right. Um, and subsequently pirated, perhaps by Riccio's probable successor, Desidero da Firenze. And there's an example on the left, which I think probably re re 
refers to the upper description. Another standing satyr, uh, standing upper half naked, the rest furry, holding a horn in both hands, um, would seem to be the figure on the left. Um, this is likely to be another Severa model known in numerous versions. I've speculated in my recent Wallace catalogue whether it might have been made to accompany the bronze you see on the right, Severa Satyress and Baby Satyr inkstands, which peculiarly um, are never found with a sander. Um, which you would use to put on your wet ink. So perhaps the standing satyr, which you could pick up very easily, um, would in some versions have had a sand, a, a, a pot for sand which, in his hands. Another bronze from the Padua and Ambit of Andrea Riccio, clearly identifiable from Canonici's description, is the Triton and Nereid, a version of which is here in the Frick collection. And the Frick example is the only one in which the Triton still holds an object on his shoulder, as in Canonici's description, where he says that he supports a vase on his shoulder. Two other bronzes are easily identifiable as well-known models of men contorted into acrobatic poses. Uh, the one on the left, a bronze figure of a naked man, his back against the ground looking upwards. He holds his legs above his shoulders his hands above his buttocks. For this one, Kanonachan usually gives us a hint of what he thought about it, firstly describing it as ancient, and then as a lamp. And generally, the inventory shows no interest in the possible function of the bronzes, to the extent that I wonder whether Kanonachi's head of bronze, which shows its teeth, could have been an example of a class of small oil lamps or inkwells in the forms of heads of young Africans or, or monstrous satyrs. Another object which must have been an inkstand depicted a kneeling young man. Uh, very similar except for the reverse position of the arms to this figure in Vienna, uh, which now is missing any ink pots or candle holders it might once have had. A little standing putto was probably a cupid figure from Severo da Ravenna's prolific workshop. And note that it says that the, the fists were held tight, as you see is very clearly the case in this bronze. This bronze is found mounted on the lids of inkstands, but also, it seems, independently, as in the example in, in Oxford. And Canonici had two more very similar sounding little figures of boys holding urns, the descriptions of which match surviving bronze models. So in the middle on, on the right. Um, the one holding the vase in the middle is known in several versions. And this is derived from a large candelabrum in the Venetian church of San Stefano, dated 1577 the casting of which has been attributed by Charles Avery to Andrea de Bresciano's son-in-law, Orazio. So this is one where we do have, um, if you like, a date we can, we can fix for the bronze. A male figure with his left hand above his head, his right hand above his buttocks, must be a figure known from versions in the v &A and elsewhere. You see the v &A example on the right, which has been identified as the god Pluto and associated with Benvenuto Cellini. It's less clear what the bronze described as a man pushing both his hands before him could have been. Perhaps a version of the flute playing fawn, of which is one in the frick, although I think canonically would have said a fawn, probably. Perhaps it's a small, it was a small bronze version of a celebrated large bronze statue of the Adorante, um, a bronze which was in a Veronese collection in the 16th century. So as you can sense, um, as we come towards the end of the list, we're entering onto less secure territory. Canonici had a pair of bronze figures which he described as appearing to be one of the ancient Roman tribunes. Um, and he, he cited that they wore buskins on their feet. Um, so I think it must, they must have looked very much like these bronze figures of Roman emperors, which are found in quite a few collections. But none of the examples I've traced so far match for Canonici examples exactly in terms of the position of the hands. And of course, finally, we have a couple of models which have thus far more or less eluded me, although well, I hope hands are going to go up immediately to point me in the right direction. Um, the second, a bronze standing figure of a young man with a mantle completely covering him, except for the right arm, the chest, legs. Well, it was, seems a dead ringer to, for this bronze in Vienna, except he's holding a book, not a, a dish. So we're, we're nearly there. Um, what general conclusions can we draw about the Canonici collection as described by its owner? 
Well, interestingly, unlike the paintings, there's no attempt to attribute any bronzes, but as we shall see, Roberto evidently regarded them all as Roman, not modern. And that relates to something Malcolm said. Also, unlike the paintings, no individual valuations are given, although at the end of a list, a paragraph sets the fine to be paid by Canonici's heirs, should any items be lost, at 100 scudi per bronze figure, 25 for other bronzes. And this compares well with the paintings, the great majority of which are valued at 100 scudi, or rather less. The Antonello was uh, valued at 100. The nature of the collection, though, is really fascinating. A apparently rather few modern bronzes, and significantly absolutely nothing that can be associated with Gian Bologna and his Florentine school, which is what you might expect in a collection formed around 1600, but instead North Italian, Venetian, or Paduan bronzes, some of them fairly recent, such as the Little Putto, but most of which would have been a century or more old by the 1620s. Roberto Canonici, however, did seem to believe that his bronzes were almost all Roman or Etruscan in origin. He concludes the listing with two very odd-sounding items, and I put up the descriptions there, and I have no idea of anything they could relate to, but I'm looking. Um, these were given to him by Cardinal Francesco Vendramin, Patriarch of Venice, from a large group of bronzes apparently discovered in a room during <coughs> excavations of the city of Adria near Rovigo. And I show you um, a group of little Etruscan figures that might have come out of the same excavations and were in fact published in 1625. Canonici wrote about his two little figures, but they were the first figures ever made in the history of the world. Even if the figures are ill-formed, they deserve very great respect for their antiquity, as do many of the others heretofore described, having been made in the times of the Roman Republic. Note that crucial last sentence. Now, it should be recalled here, and we've already been reminded of this by Malcolm, that the identity um, of the great Paduan sculptor Andrea Riccio as the maker of the wonderful oil lamp in the Frick collection had been completely forgotten just a little over 100 years later when Fortunius Lycetus, writing in 1652 and illustrating the lamp in this wonderful engraving, firmly stated that it had been excavated. So, short memory, wishful thinking, and no doubt some active skullduggery combined to ensure that by Roberto Canonici's time, and for a good two centuries thereafter, most Renaissance bronzes of classical subject matter were automatically assumed to be Greek or Roman. The virtual reconstruction of Roberto Canonici's collection, which I tried to do here, makes a wonderful case study for this phenomenon, which could itself be the subject of a whole conference. Thanks, though, to Canonici's carefulness and his very, very careful inventory, we have an extraordinarily rare glimpse into an early 17th century collection of bronzes assembled by a serious and passionate collector. And I think we can say that Roberto's wish that his collection be preserved for posterity is at least thereby partly fulfilled. Thank you very much. <laughs>